Hi, everyone. Hello. Can you hear me all right? Awesome. OK, let's dive right in. So 100 years ago, the idea that somebody would get on a bicycle that's had its back wheel removed to pedal as hard and fast as they can for 30 minutes at a time to get absolutely nowhere would have sounded preposterous. But this is what many of us do today. And why do we do this? Well, because we know in 2024 that physical exercise is absolutely necessary for our physical health. And this cultural understanding is commonplace now, but it wasn't until very recently that this happened. Part of the motivation behind that cultural understanding was actually some foundational work that was done by a military physician who conducted the very first studies involving military service members. He coined the term and wrote the book, Aerobics, and this actually fundamentally transformed the way that not only the Army and other military services thought about physical training, but really how all of us now think about physical training. So the first adopters of this work of his, this evidence-based work, were the military services, and then he went on to continue to conduct a lot of research that shifted the way that the military trained for physical excellence, but also fully ignited an entire field. In fact, since those very early studies, about 600,000 articles have been published on the topic relating physical exercise and physical health. This actual blur burgeoning field is the reason that now our public health officials can give us precise evidence-based guidance on what to do to keep our bodies physically fit so we can be in peak shape. But what about the mind? How do we achieve a peak mind? What are the exercises, the mental exercises that we can do daily to improve our effectiveness, to ensure that we have successful performance and that our well-being is not only intact, but that we are thriving? This is a question that my research lab has been pursuing for the last 15 years or, or so. And as a, a neuroscientist and a researcher, this is the kind of work that really excites me. And some of the most provocative, and I would say maybe even compelling research studies that we've been able to do have been in partnership with the military, and in particular with the Army. So as you can see, we work with many different um, military services, as well as uh, in, the, in this country and nationally, internationally, sorry. And we do this uh, so that we can understand better how it is that they're able to perform well, under normal circumstances, but in particular under very high stress circumstances. And in addition to service members, we work with a variety of civilian groups that are also in some sense high stress, high demand. So first responders, elite athletes, medical and nursing professionals, even undergraduates, because all of these groups will have intervals in which they need to not only perform well, but they may be physically and psychologically challenged to the point potentially of exhaustion and have to still perform at their peak. So this could be things like readiness training or field training, pre-deployment training in the military context, or for where I live in Miami, for first responders, it could be hurricane season. The way in which we go about understanding what is going on to see if our training that we, the training that we offer may be successful is by indexing a very powerful brain system, the brain's attention system. Part of the reason we select attention is because it actually biases and, and, and influences every single thing, almost, that the brain does. It is extremely powerful in terms of the way it controls the rest of the brain's functioning to the point at which sometimes I'll refer to this as the brain's boss. Our attention is our boss. And in our work with these various organizations and these various participants, what we can do is track what happens to attention over these high stress intervals and see if it is the case that when we train folks, they actually are able to benefit in terms of their attention. Now, for, for service members and first responders, it's absolutely key that they don't have attentional lapses, that they don't have distractibility because unfortunately those could have life or death consequences. But for all of us, our attention is vitally important. 
And unfortunately, in our modern world right now, we might also feel that we are battling our attention quite frequently, and it doesn't always feel like it's a fair fight. And what I'm talking about here is essentially the technology-saturated world that we live in, the information overload that we live in. And this can produce so many effects that leave us feeling fractured and fragmented. When we think about things like social media companies, they are not only capturing our attention, but they are luring, pulling, and mining our attention as data. As they say often, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. And that can oftentimes leave us feeling even more hopeless, almost to the point where we want to just completely abandon it all. And I would say, let's put the impracticalities of doing that aside for a moment and just think about what that would actually mean. If you were really able to let go of every kind of sophisticated or not that sophisticated technological um, advance in our digital world. You'd be sort of like a monastic in a cave, right? Sitting there quietly, really enjoying your peace. Well, unfortunately, I'm sorry to tell you that is just not the case because soon enough, you will be faced with the most potent, most pervasive, and most personalized form of distraction, and that is your own mind you are going to have to contend with all of the thoughts that are going to arise one by one, incessantly calling upon your attention and really challenging it over and over and over again. So let's say at some point you say, I've had enough, I'm gonna return back from my digital detox and I'm gonna re-enter the world of the modern times. Well, what you might notice after doing something like this is that, well, that mind is still there. It is constantly going to pull you away from what you're trying to do that may be interfacing with technology. So in some sense, what I'm saying is that uh, in many ways, people might feel that technology is the solution to our problems, but in some sense, it's adding to already the sources of distractibility that we experience, and our mind is going nowhere. It is with us all along for the ride. In fact, circumstances like this, where you're trying to do some task, interfacing with technology, let's say, and your mind gets in the way, is extremely pervasive, all right? 50% of our waking moments, our mind is not on the task at hand. And we know this from hundreds of participants and dozens of studies that have looked at this. So think about what that means. We're together in this presentation for, you know, not just mine, but for the entire session, 60 minutes. You'll be gone for 30 of those minutes, right? You'll be looking right up at the stage. We would never know as presenters where your mind is at, but you might take those small excursions away from what is happening right now uh, to your private thoughts. Anybody have that experience already? Hopefully, hopefully not. All right, so well, how are we gonna understand how all of this is happening? Our capacity to feel overloaded, overwhelmed, our mind wandering? Well, one way is to really understand what I mean when I even use this term, attention. Right, probably you all know what attention is, you have a sense of it, and my guess is when you think about attention, you think of something like this, the capacity to be focused. And that's absolutely the case, but it ends up from a brain science point of view, we don't have one form of attention, we actually have three main subsystems of attention. And these subsystems work together in a coordinated fashion to powerfully influence our life. The first is actually this notion of being able to be focused, something formally called the brain's orienting system. And I like to use the metaphor for this system of being like a flashlight. So if you're in a darkened room, a flashlight is a really handy tool. Wherever it is that that flashlight points, you get crisper, clearer, high integrity information. We can direct that flashlight course to the external environment, to sights and sounds, but we can also direct it internally to our thoughts, our memories, and our emotions, our decision making. All of this requires an internally directed attention system. Almost the exact opposite of that focused, clear, crystal, um, and, and privileged way of, of, focus, of uh, orienting our attention is the second system, something we call the alerting system. Now, it's not narrow and directed, it's actually broad and diffused and receptive. This system's job is to ensure that we don't privilege anything, that we are at the ready, able to process whatever comes our way in this moment. And when that happens, we can immediately act. So being alert, just as important as being focused, but a very different form of attention. And a third way we can pay attention is something called executive functioning. I like to use the metaphor of a juggler. Executive functioning's job is to ensure that our goals and our actions align. And when they don't align, 
we have to correct for something, either update the goal or fix the action so it does align. This system is involved in monitoring and managing what we're doing to make sure that we are goal aligned in our actions. All of these systems, hopefully all of these are resonating with you, are very, very uh, important and they work together holding hands in some sense with each other. But together we could think about attention as a type of fuel. Because it is limited, and I'm very happy that, uh, that today, and even in the nutrition talk symposium early, earlier, there are many ways we can keep ourselves fueled up. You'll hear about a couple more uh, in the session this morning. Being fully fueled up is so incredibly important, it, and it does things like allow us to use our attention for fundamental human activities, like thinking and connecting and feeling emotion. So what happens when we're fully fueled up? Hopefully many of you have this experience. When we're thinking, we're logical and our decision making is rational. When we're connected, we're actually able to extend care and concern, we're empathetic. And when we're actually experiencing an emotion, we are emotionally balanced and regulated. Unfortunately, we're not always on full. And when we end up teetering on empty, which can happen with a lot of demanding circumstances, we're illogical, irrational disconnected and dysregulated. So if you think about what it is that might lead us to teetering on empty, I could give you a lot of different descriptions, but one word kind of captures it all. It's this experience of perceived stress that the circumstances we're encountering far exceed what we're capable of handling. And in the military context and, and first responder communities as well, stress is oftentimes related to common common things that, that uh, these individuals are required to do, things that are uh, in, under circumstances that are volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, or that term VUCA that many of you are probably familiar with. So what happens when we experience stress? Well, I already told you some of the consequences for our thinking, feeling, and connecting. But as a brain scientist, some of the things that we're interested in looking at is what are the objective consequences, either in the way the brain is functioning or how behavior is impacted. So what we do is we partner with individuals over high stress intervals. We try to capture what's going on at the beginning of an interval in terms of objective attention task performance or brain measures. And then a few to several weeks later, we do the same battery of tasks and we look to see what attention looked like over those periods of time. And the bad news is right on this, this slide here. Attention significantly declines over high stress intervals. Now, if we took these same individuals over normal circumstances that didn't have VUCA associated with them, they'd be more like that dashed line up there, stable and strong. Knowing this makes us very, very concerned. And it, before we could find solutions, we gotta ask an important question, which is, okay, well, what's going on? You explained attention, you explained the consequences of stress. What does stress do to attention? And this requires me sharing with you another very important thing that the human mind is capable of doing. And you all hopefully haven't been doing too much of this, but I'm sure some of it's been happening as I've been talking. Mental time travel, all right? And I like to use this metaphor of this MP3 player uh, sort of uh, idea. So when I say mental time travel, I'm talking about the mind's capacity to shift attention in time. We can rewind the mind to experience the past, relive it and learn from it productively, a very, very important thing that we can do. Or we can fast forward the mind to plan and ensure that what we do next is appropriate. But under high stress, high demand circumstances, all this stuff is not happening all that productively. When we rewind the mind under high stress, oftentimes we'll be caught in ruminating, regretting and reliving circumstances that have already happened. Or we may fast forward stuck in catastrophizing and worrying about things that not only haven't happened yet, but they may never happen. We made them up in our minds. And when this happens, when we, when we ruminate or we worry, we make a lot of errors. This is that 50%, which ends up going up to an even higher number over high stress intervals. We mind wander. And what I mean by that is that we have off task thoughts when there is really a demand and task in front of us. We make errors, we miss critical information. Our decision making will get faulty and this is quite problematic. So what can we do about this? Well, the opposite of a wandering, stress-prone mind is a mindful one. Mindfulness has to do with keeping that button right on play so that we're actually paying attention to the moment-to-moment -moment unfolding of our lives. Now, if all I had to do was say, okay, please go be mindful and you'll be good to go, um, 
that would be wonderful, but unfortunately that's not the case. As I said, our beginning point is 50% of the time we're mind wandering, and most of this time we're unaware that's happened. So we can't simply will ourselves to be mindful. But what we can do, at least this was our proposal, is train for it. And there are a whole battery of um, mindfulness exercises that actually come from the world's wisdom traditions, whether it was from medieval monks or the Stoic philosophers or the contemplatives of the East. And these practices have now been able to be packaged and offered in a way that don't require any particular worldview. I'm gonna show you in the next slide one foundational practice. And we're not gonna have time to do it, but I'll just tell you what, what it is. Um, this is something called mindfulness of the breath. And it ends up, as you can see from the slide, using all three systems of attention. The intention is to focus sensations and have an anchor for your attention on breath-related sensations. You're not controlling it, you're not doing a box breathing, a diaphragmatic breathing, you're just observing what's happening, keeping that flashlight on your breath-related sensations. After you've been doing this for a while, soon enough, you might notice that the mind has wandered. And that's the next aspect of the instruction. When the mind wanders, notice that. And only when we notice it will we be able to do something about it, which brings us to the third step. When you notice that the mind has wandered away, simply redirect that flashlight back to those breath-related sensations. So it ends up that with this simple practice and many others, what we can do is mental push-ups. And they have these simple steps. Focus, notice, redirect, and repeat. And the question that, of course, we're asking is when you have people do this, for some period of time, daily, what happens? Are there benefits? And we've been able to spend the last seven years or so trying to hone in on the lowest dose prescription where we can offer people in the most time effective manner what they can do with their attention with regard to these mindfulness practices. We've been able to narrow it down to about four weeks of time where we formally introduce people through two hour sessions, four, two hours a week for four weeks, eight hours to introduce them to what the practices are, and then engage in mindfulness exercises about 12 minutes a day, all right? So not too much time, but some amount of time. And does it work is the next thing we wanted to ask, uh, looking together with our military colleagues and offering them these practices. And I'm very happy to say yes. Unlike those individuals in our studies who are also high demand, stress interval, engaging military service members who we didn't provide the training to, those that received the training actually benefited. They stayed stable over time, which in this case is actually success because or else they would have declined. The really good news is that those that really took this exercise to heart and did it exactly as we prescribed, the more they practiced, the more they benefited. And there were some subset of individuals who really got better than where they started by engaging in these mindfulness exercises. So I'm just gonna leave, leave you with one important thought. Please do your push-ups. Please consider introducing mindfulness and mindfulness exercises into your wellness and success toolkit and really benefit in the same way that our military is understanding that we can train our mind to improve our life. Thank you very much. We have time for about one or two questions. Anybody from the group? Of course, you could save it to the end too, if that's preferred. All right, excellent, thank you. Crystal clear. Wonderful. <laughs> There are multiple types of exercises. The, 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 first of all, we're not doing this so we can become like Olympic level breath followers, who cares, right? It's so we can cultivate these attentional capacities so we can devote them to whatever it is that we're doing, reading an email, having a conversation, et cetera. The other kinds of practices um, are things like taking that flashlight and now scanning the body. So you're systematically going through the body, focusing on various body parts and the sensations that arise. And then the other kind of aspect would be having practices that broaden, really maximizing the exercising of that alerting system. So we're taking a broad receptive stance. But these are very well prescribed. And about, uh, uh, we do, no, each 12 minute practice, practice is just one of those. And then over the course of the week, we change the prescription. So you're getting a different type of practice uh, week by week to kind of build your toolkit. And then, of course, you've got to keep doing it after that. If you discontinue, the benefits will evaporate in the same way if we stop physically exercising, our bodies aren't going to stay fit. Yes, of course. Yes, we, so this is a very, very important question. So the question was, 
do you do this like in, in the middle of, of doing the intensive activity or should you do it beforehand? Well, it's just very much like physical, physical health, right? So at least when I think about it, my military colleagues, they're working out every single day. They don't wanna miss it, why? Uh, because in the moment that you need your body to be physically fit, you can't then get on the ground and start doing push-ups. You need to embody this, and the brain is the same way. We need to prepare our minds to be strong and fit when it comes to our attention, so that when it's actually needed, we're ready to deploy it. Excellent. Thank you. All right, we'll save all for the questions uh, for later. I personally am a huge believer of the mindfulness training and have read Dr. Jha's book. I, I believe it. I still need to do more push-ups personally, so... Um, but uh, our next speaker is, she's a research psychologist, uh, currently the chief of our performance assessment and chemical evaluation laboratory, also at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. Uh, she'll be giving you a talk on eye cover. It's Dr. Emily Lowry Gianta. Good morning, everyone. Um, today I'm excited to talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. Um, in the context of intense stress or traumatic events. So I want to begin by asking you to imagine something with me. Imagine that you're a soldier and that your unit has been deployed to an active area of conflict. There are known enemy combatants. Things are happening every day. You feel like you're really amped up. Your team is sent in to an empty building. Your mission is to make sure that it's all clear. So your team enters, you go on the first floor, check rooms, room after room, all clear. Things are good. Your commanding officer tells you and your buddy Jones, go upstairs, make sure the second floor is clear. The rest of the team is gonna stay here. Make sure no one else comes in. So you and your buddy Jones start going up the stairs. You can feel yourself starting to get a little bit stressed out, right? You're trained for this, you know what to do, but you can still feel like you're getting, um, like your stress response is getting engaged. So you go upstairs, you turn to the room to your left, you check the first room, it's clear. You go to turn to go into the second room on your right, all of a sudden you hear gunfire. You're under, you're under fire. You don't know where it's coming from, you start you know, getting worked up. Your heart starts racing, your mind starts racing, and then suddenly it goes quiet. You have a moment to look around you and try to figure out where the shots came from and what's going on. You look over your left shoulder and you notice that your buddy Jones is on the floor. His back's against the wall. He is breathing really rapidly um, and he just has this blank stare on his face. What's going on? You run over to him. You check him, make sure he hasn't been hit. Check him for physical wounds. Everything seems fine, but he's still unresponsive. You shake him. You call his name, Jones, Jones, come back. What's going on? Still unresponsive. What's happening to Jones? He's having an extreme acute stress reaction. His amygdala has completely hijacked the rest of his brain. So the amygdala is the fear center of the brain. And when it goes into overdrive, it can cause us to go into an extreme acute stress reaction by overriding the attention modulating parts of our brain and the thinking parts of our brain, like the prefrontal cortex. So generally, acute stress reactions are adaptive. They help us to organize fight or flight responses, make rapid decisions so that we can you know, decide it's time to move out. We have to make this action in order to ensure survival. But when these acute stress reactions become extreme, when the amygdala takes over the rest of the brain, we end up experiencing things like stupor or paralysis. Um, sometimes even dissociating, having kind of a third-person experience, out-of-body experience. Or you can kind of go the opposite. You can become completely hyperactive, impulsive. You're not making decisions. Your actions aren't based on, on thinking decisions. You're just acting to act, right? It's almost a panic-like state. And so when this happens, we're no longer in a stress response that's adaptive, we've transitioned into a maladaptive stress response. So, research by Dr. Amy Adler at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research suggests that this happens to about one in six soldiers who um, experience conflict during deployment. So that's one in six soldiers, about 20%. 
Of those, about 50% will report that the performance impairment that they experience through the acute stress reaction lasts more than five minutes. That's life and death for a soldier. So what's going on? Can we control it? We've learned a lot of important things about acute stress reactions over the past few years. First, they can happen to anyone. We don't really have good predictors for who they're going to happen to and how we can prevent them. Second, it's not a personal failure. It's not a lack of control or you know, somebody didn't pay attention during training. This is your body's biological response to stress just going into overdrive. We're not really sure why it happens. It could be the demands of the trauma that you're experiencing. It could be something biological that's inherent to you. It happens to a lot of people, and um, we're just really not sure why. It's pretty common and fairly normal. Um, something else that we didn't realize until recently is that there is something that we can do about it. And so to that end, Dr. Adler's team at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research developed a behavioral intervention called iCover. So iCover is a six-step procedure that you can do in real time as somebody's experiencing an acute stress reaction, even during combat, right? You just need to get to a safe enough place to be able to administer it. It's designed to be administered rapidly, and it's very easily trained. So soldiers can quickly pick this up you know, kind of become experts in eye cover so that they know how to help their buddies as they experience um, extreme acute stress reactions in the field. So the six steps of eye cover um, begin with the need to identify, right? So you're looking at somebody, you're recognizing that they are in need of help because they're experiencing a possible acute stress reaction. So right now, we don't have any objective markers of an acute stress reaction. It's just kind of you call it like you see it, although the Army is working on those more objective measurements of acute stress reactions. So after you've identified that you have a buddy who needs your help, you go over to them and you connect with them. You get on their level, and then you do something to help connect with them. You can put your hand on their arm or on their shoulder. You might look at them and request eye contact with them. You find a way of engaging them um, so that they feel connected with. So next, you'll say something very simple and offer commitment. Something as simple as, hey, I'm here for you. I'm not going anywhere. I can help you. You're not alone. Then you move on to verify the facts. You state who you are, state where you are, and what your mission is. You want to keep all of this very simple and very direct. And you also kind of want to stay a little bit stoic, right? You don't want to inject extra emotion into um, the method as you go. After you verify the facts, you establish the order. So you want to give a very simple summary of the key events of like the past few minutes. Um, you know, we're in this place. We were given a mission to go into a building and check that it's all clear. The bottom floor is all clear, but we came upstairs and we came under fire, right? You just go through what happened very simply over the last couple of minutes to help someone kind of reorient to where they are. And then finally, you request a simple action. You look around, you select something that's very simple and very tangible to accomplish. It might be something as simple as, you know, grab your weapon, stand up, readjust your helmet, go stand by that door, keep watch. Something you know that they'll be safely able to engage in, but the idea is that you give them a task so that they can become re-engaged in their mission. And hopefully, as they're starting to feel better, the acute stress response is coming down. You move them out of that extreme acute stress response into the adaptive acute stress response. And all of this, we think, is happening because you're encouraging the thinking part of your brain, the prefrontal cortex, to come online. And you need that to counterbalance that activation of the amygdala. We need some engagement of the amygdala, but we don't need too much. It's kind of like um, the three bears in the porridge, right? So you need some amygdala activation, but you need that input from the prefrontal cortex to help moderate it. And something like eye cover is providing that moderation. So eye cover was first adapted by the US Army starting in 2017. 
Since then, it's been adapted and utilized in the US Air Force, as well as the Navy, and several countries throughout the world. So Canada, Norway, Germany, and Ukraine have already adapted iCover, um, and others are looking to adapt it as well. Um, and the cool thing about iCover is that you can actually adapt it to the needs of your culture as well as the, um, as well as your language, right? So it's the concepts underlying iCover, but then different acronyms that go into uh, each country's program. So if you actually want to take some time in YouTube iCover, you'll be able to see the training video that Dr. Adler's team has put together. It's really wonderful. It really helps to frame the problem of acute stress reactions and contextualize it. And then it also walks you through the steps of iCover and kind of goes through some of that neurobiology that I was talking about. Um, you also can find some reviews by active duty service members who have YouTube channels and review army type things on the side. Um, and all of the feedback that they've been getting from those venues has been very positive. Um, they recognize acute stress reactions as a real problem, and um, they like the concept of iCover as a solution for that problem. Empirically, because it's very difficult to test the e efficacy of something like iCover in theater, right, where it's being used, um, we actually have instead looked to how people are receiving the iCover training. So are they liking it? Are they engaged in it? Do they feel better after they take the training? And the answers to those questions are all yes. Um, after taking eye cover training, soldiers report that they feel more confident in their own ability to help someone who's having an acute stress reaction. And they also feel more confident in their team. They feel like if they themselves are experiencing a reaction like this, that their team is equipped to help them. Um, they also feel that the experience of an acute stress reaction is understandable. So through this training, because we're also educating people about what acute stress reactions are, we're doing the necessary step of showing people that this is a normal response to stress. It's just gone into overdrive. We're not sure why, but there are things we can do about it. So by raising awareness about acute stress reactions, we're able to help soldiers prepare for what they might encounter while they're on deployment. We're able to help them contextualize it as rather common and kind of normal. Um, and we're also able to relieve that burden of believing, there's, you know, I failed, there's something wrong with me, or my team has failed me, something's wrong with them. Um, so altogether, um, we believe that iCover is really giving soldiers a tool to feel like they have some control in an otherwise uncontrollable, chaotic environment. So because of this su successful adoption and adaptation of iCover in, oops, sorry, in the military context, um, we started wondering if there might be applications in the civilian context as well. Um, and so to that end, in the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Adler was approached by medical professionals who reported that their team members were freezing up or you know, getting panic-like symptoms in the face of treating um, patients during the COVID-19 pandemic. So some examples were you know, whenever they were around PPE or something, they would start freezing up, or whenever they would have to go in to see a patient, um, they would have a, a great amount of difficulty doing so, even though in the past they hadn't. So they were demonstrating some clear signs of acute stress responses during, during that pandemic. And so Dr. Adler and her team got together and they developed iCover Med. So basically they took the Army's version of iCover and they adapted it for a medical setting using medical examples of how you might approach someone who's having an acute stress reaction. And that was successfully implemented during the pandemic. <coughs> Another natural uh, extension of this work is to first responders um, and other professionals that experience high rates of stress in the course of their daily work. And then finally, we wanted to test the hypothesis that eye cover might be effective in more of a general population um, in a clinical trial. So we're partnering with um, UNC Chapel Hill and Dr. Sam McLean and his team in order to evaluate this hypothesis in people who have been recently traumatized and are seeking care for distress in the emergency department of 
a network of hospitals. And so to do this, we'll be identifying people who might potentially be having an acute stress reaction because they're showing clear signs of one. And um, someone who's trained in eye cover will approach them and administer the intervention. And then we'll ask them to complete simple cognitive and emotional tasks to look at how performance improves following the intervention compared to no intervention. And so through this work, we're hoping that we can get a snapshot of what the efficacy of a behavioral intervention like eye cover is for acute stress reactions. Um, and we're also hoping to learn how eye cover might be valuable in other uh, contexts outside of the military. So even, you know, whatever the results of this study are, we're at the very beginning. I think it's safe to say that eye cover is a tool that helps people to feel empowered to take action under very stressful conditions. It allows them to know that there's something that they can do to alleviate distress in someone that they are observing. But also it gives them an element of control over the situation. So we're hoping that through research that has resulted in things like eye cover, we can develop these types of tools to alleviate acute stress reactions and also help to raise awareness about them and help to provide people with tools to manage them. So where previously we thought that acute stress reactions were a problem without a solution, I think here we've demonstrated that you can actually do something about them. And in fact, maybe we all should be doing something about them. So um, with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Any questions from the group? Okay, perfect. Yeah, let me go ahead and just bring the microphone over to you guys. Yeah, so how long is the eye cover training? Uh, how long is the eye cover training and uh, how long it is endured during the people? I mean, how long? Sure. If it's, yes, how is the tension rate? So it can be trained in a single session. Um, they've done research to see if you could train completely virtually or if, you, if it was better to train in person. It, it is better to train in person. Um, and then as part of the study they did to evaluate the training, they actually had people go through a real world scenario. So obviously I think that helps to encode the training a little bit more. Um, but generally I think it can be taught in a classroom, through the video, and then some type of quick exercise afterwards. One question, uh, it's related one. So how do you identify acute stress reaction? Because I think it's one way you can see like if someone's like injured or shot, like, you know, that's one thing. But right. in a more like civilian setting or like first responder, it might not be as obvious. Right, that's a great question. Um, right now we're at a point where, you know, you call it like you see it. So you'll see someone who's obviously in distress because you're understanding what's going on in the context, you know this isn't like a panic attack that's associated with panic disorder, for example. Um, so you are seeing someone who's not really engaged, basically they're reacting to the environment in an extreme way. The way they're reacting isn't appropriate for the demands of what's going on. And so in that case, you could identify that individual, see that they're highly distressed and agitated, and um, use something like eye cover to help them calm down. The good thing about eye cover is that, um, you know, it, there's a risk in the sense of, you know, you wanna be in safety as you're doing it, right? You don't wanna be like out in the open. But aside from that, there's really not a downside to engaging in eye cover as long as you have the time and you're in a good location to do it. So there won't be any adverse effects per se if, you know, you identify, if you misidentify someone as having an acute stress reaction. Uh, and you use it. Yeah. Have you thought about what if a soldier is by themselves and experience this? Is it possible to adapt it to yourself or no? Because you'd have to wait that five minutes to sort of overcome it. Right, that's a great question. And I don't think it's one that we really know the answer to yet. So I don't think someone could specifically do eye cover on their own, but that's where like Dr. Jaw's training with mindfulness might help to you know, calm yourself down. And the Army does have approaches that they teach um, to help build resiliency in that way. The really wonderful thing about eye cover and the, the approach to the training of it 
is that it does make soldiers aware of acute stress reactions and that they might happen to them. So those soldiers, I would posit, might be a little bit more sensitive to knowing the signs that they themselves are starting to have one, and they might be able to find someone who, who knows I cover and could do it for them, or perhaps engage in some deep breathing or, or what the environment allows to try to calm themselves down through the resiliency training that they've already re uh, received. That's a great question. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll save all questions for the end, of course, individually, but thank you, Dr. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Our next talk um, will be from our sleep research scientist, Dr. Tina Burke. She's the associate director of the behavioral biology branch at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, and she will be presenting on novel innovations to obtain restorative sleep in less time. Dr. Burke, thank you. Thanks. It's interesting, as I come up here and, I, and I'm listening to everyone talk, I was like, man, I can't wait until there's eye cover pee to help with my toddler having an amygdala hijack. So I'm gonna coin that now, so if that comes out later, I can be like, oh, that's my, my use of that. Um, but really what I wanna come in and talk to you about today is talking about sleep as a way to help you perform and sleep for resiliency. And so as a part of that, and as we think of sleeping for resiliency, what we mean by resiliency is one, our ability to counteract challenge, but then also one's ability to recover after being challenged. And so when I talk and think about that, I have to put it into different perspectives because I'd like to say we, we all get the amount of sleep that we want. Uh, just in case you're, you're looking at this wonderful photo, I, I know that I'm, I'm riding up here with a, a large dose of caffeine. Um, I understand the irony of that. But just to get a good sense, I'd like to know, this is an interactive presentation, show of hands, who gets 10 hours of sleep or less? Now my expectation is everyone right now is gonna be raising their hand, 10 hours or less. Nine hours or less, put your hand down if you have nine hours or less, which again, Hopefully most people are up. Eight hours or less? Seven hours or less? Six hours or less? I love my military people there keeping their hand up. Five hours or less? Four? Well, for those of you who put their hands down after seven hours or less, you're actually like one third of the US population. Now in 2020, the CDC came out with the fact that 33% of adult Americans get less than the recommended seven hours or more of sleep. And it's very interesting when I try to talk about sleep, of course, in the military context. Um, I have heard this too, I'll sleep when I die. And I was like, oh, you might die sooner. Um, I, I, hate to tell, <laughs> I hate to tell you that. Um, please note my spouse also says that and he's been ride or die with me for quite a while. However, when we think about this, it's a lot easier for me to communicate how sleep loss is impacting you actually through alcohol intoxication. So if someone gets five hours of sleep, five consecutive nights in a row, you start to perform at a 20% deficit. That's equivalent to someone who's performing at a 0.08 blood alcohol concentration. Now quiz, anyone know why, why that, that number is important? Yes, that is the legal intoxication limit here in the US. Now, I can change it up because if I were to say not the average sleep that you're getting, if I were to ask you, how much sleep did you guys attending South by get last night? <laughs> but I'm like, how many hands would have gone down? Like less than, less than three or four. But so just by staying up a couple of more hours, so being awake for about 17 to 19 hours, you start performing like someone who has a 0.05% blood alcohol content. That's actually equivalent to what we call ability impaired. Now, if I just take that one step further and we have someone who's awake for 24 hours, that person will perform like they have a 0.1% blood alcohol content. Now, it's very easy for us to really feel what it's like to be drunk, right? Most people, I'm hoping everyone here who's drinking is over 21. I don't encourage underage drinking. But it's very easy for us to feel like it, what it feels like to be drunk. It's actually very difficult for us to perceive sleep loss. Our brain, 
are hardwired to help us persevere, and it detects change. And so if I'm consistently not getting the sleep that I'm getting, it's very hard for me to perceive that. When we put someone on a CPAP, which is a device to try and help them breathe if they have obstructive sleep apnea, for example, what can happen is they're like, wow, I didn't realize how tired I was. And I was like, yeah, I know. Because our bodies have that hard time detecting change. So why aren't we getting the sleep that we need? So it could be a lot of things. Just like Amishi was saying, our wonderful devices. And unfortunately, that can get you in multiple ways. It can be the stimulation from the light just on the screen. It could be the stimulation from the social media posts, what you're reading. It could be the fact that you're just up binge watching your favorite TV episode or watching that movie on your favorite streaming application. Those things can help keep you awake at night. Now, it's not just that, though. It could be something like your stress. It's that time to quiet down, start thinking about all of those things that you didn't do throughout the day. It also could be a biological basis. You could have insomnia. You can have an illness like COVID. A lot of these things can contribute to that. If you're like me and traveled here, it could be associated with, with transmeridian travel. It could also be something like your family. Like I just joked, I have a wonderful toddler at home. I also have a nine month old at home. I know I'm not getting the sleep that I need. I'm not, I'm like, I'm not presenting drunk, I swear. No, just, <laughs> but so what happens with that is when we look at these things, sometimes it can be things that we can control. Sometimes it can just be, it's not a poor priority that we can make it be. Now, for me to identify kind of what the process of sleep is like, I like to think of my apartment. So I start the day, it's nice and clean, there's no dishes. When I think there's no dishes, there's nothing on the floor, it's not chaotic, there's no toys everywhere. And then all of a sudden, my children wake up, my husband wakes up, and we start going about the day. Now, what do you think my apartment looks like as I go through a typical 16-hour day? By the end of the day, it's a giant clutter fest. Like, like over here, I wish this was a picture of my home. It's not, but it looks like that. Just add extra toys and a lot more clutter, and then that will be the actual example. But when we process the information throughout the day, we do the same thing. This is the same thing that's going on in your brain. You're building up tons of things, new collections. So by the end of the day, I have a sink full of dishes, I have toys strewn everywhere, I have tons of papers on the counter, and of course the mystery black hole that holds everything, my kitchen table that I can't actually use to eat on. But when I think about sleep, sleep is our ability to start and slow down for the day. I view cleaning my apartment as a restorative process. However, I am not able to truly restore that process until the demands of my time lessen. Thank God my children go to bed. My spouse goes to bed. And then I'm able to actually actively clean up and repair all of this clutter that has gone on. Sleep does the same thing. But what do we actually view as a good quality night of sleep? Now for a good quality night of sleep, really the most important thing is your ability to feel rested and restored. Now that can be a little bit different for everyone. There's individual differences. But for most people, it's about seven or more hours. This is how long it takes you to kind of clean, clean the apartment that is your brain. And when I look at what that sleep episode is comprised of, we actually can break it down into different types of stages. Now, in general, we have two main categories of the stages of sleep. One is non-rapid eye movement sleep, which can be further subdivided into lighter stages and a deeper stage of sleep. And then we also have rapid eye movement sleep or dream sleep. But really what happens as we go to, this, go to sleep is our brain activity starts to slow down and slow down. And more specifically, when I look at how our sleep is composed, all of these stages are important. So our brain will actually try and get a little bit of each of these stages in 90 minute cycles. 
However, more at the beginning part of the night, we'll actually have more deep or slow wave sleep. And then at the end of the night, we'll have more rapid eye movement or dream sleep. Now, one of the thinking that is behind this, the, the thought is that deep sleep is actually more restorative. Because we see during this time, the most emphasis of decluttering occurring during that deep sleep, where a lot of times our brain waves slow, become rhythmic. And the benefits of deep sleep are vast. But again, the thought that we try to work towards right now is if this is what our brain is prioritizing, how can I get more of it? And how can I be in that in a more quality way so that I could get more quality sleep? Now, one of the things that the Army is working on is actually some something called transcranial electrical stimulation. In doing this specifically, what I'm going to talk about is doing transcranial electrical stimulation at a slow oscillation frequency. And so I'm going to do a social experiment. Got to put my coffee down for this. All right. Now I want everyone to clap like this is the best presentation that you're seeing at South by. Yeah. All wow. Why, why did you guys start clapping in time with me? Does it all? I was like, who's the boss? No, no, this is a show from a long time ago. But what we're doing is I'm not necessarily coming out there and clapping your hands for you. But what I am doing is I'm setting a rhythm and a pace. And what this type of weak stimulation is doing for your brain is the exact same thing that I just did with you now. It is setting a rhythm that can then transition and keep you slowed just like what that's trying to do for those deep, slow wave sleep opportunities, is to try and get you in there faster and to try and have you stay there longer. Now, please note, it took you a while to get on board, right? Yeah? And some of you, not, a, not everyone, some of you refused to clap at the same time. Now, please note, hey, your brain does that too. That's what insomnia looks like. And so when we think about this, and if we can get folks into this more rhythmicity, or if I can kind of tease or nudge your brain into that, the thought is then you can get more restoration. Now this is very important for us, especially for the folks who are getting less than the seven or more hours of sleep. Now I don't wanna call you guys out, but that was a lot of us in the room, let alone the one third of you as Americans. And so as I walk away, I want you to have the main takeaway of really the importance of sleep and how getting more deep sleep can help you. Now in my example, before sleep we can have this clutter and then as we tr transition and get sleep, we can have it be decluttered and using potential technologies like that transcranial electrical stimulation at a slow oscillation frequency might allow us in a shorter period of time to get more or equivalent restoration. And one of the things that we see in our research at Rare is that we can actually do that. So we've actually provided, given, given individuals, a, a short duration of transcranial electrical stimulation at a slow oscillation frequency right before a period of sleep deprivation. And what we find is folks are more resilient. And what I mean by that is when they are facing cognitive performance throughout the day that they're being sleep deprived, they don't have as big of performance deficits as we see. And then when they recover, they recover faster. So again, I hope you walk away with a sense of how important sleep is. But we also live in the real world today, which is a lot of us aren't getting the sleep that we need but I hope you're just like me and that we're looking forward to technologies like TES at a slow oscillation frequency that can help us actually be restored with less sleep. With that, I will take any questions.
Any questions from the group? Raise your hand. Of course. Uh, thank you. Uh, I feel like you guys should both be mic'd up. I know. <laughs> but that's all right. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, oh. Just a question. So we talked about deep sleep and light sleep. So does it mean that light sleep and being those REM stages, they're not as beneficial or important? So, so almost every stage of sleep has a beneficial function. However, if you just look at the overall function of sleep, so a distinct answer is kind of elusive to us because sleep is really a whole body active function in different stages, again, can highlight, highlight different features. So we see a lot of metabolic waste removal, a lot of restructuring um, within, say, deep sleep. We also see a lot of hormonal secretion there. But then even as we get down into um, longer amounts of sleep where you might have more dominant REM sleep, then you actually see things like REM sleep can help more with, say, being creative helping you make more decisions and can be tied to other reparative and restorative hormones as well. So when we think of sleep, even though there's a composition and your, your brain and body can actually prioritize a type of sleep, um, all of them are important and each of them can serve a different type of function. We do see a lot of transition though, where we see a lot more of later sleep and specifically a, a stage called stage two sleep that also has been seen to be a lot more linked to our subjective perceptions of, of how sleepy we feel. So again, there's, there's still a lot of benefits to sleep, but there's still a lot of things that we don't know in terms of why specifically one stage or another is, is doing that. But we can see the, the downstream effects of it as it relates to our performance and our health. Great question. Yes, so yeah. I, I wanted to ask two questions. One is about resilience, because in yeah. the beginning you gave, gave the definition of resilience, that is copy with something and the recovery. Mm -hmm. But this is the question to three of us, because the, yeah. we know that resilience is a mix of different uh, combat competences. So what is the, the definition of resilience, like wide definition of resilience? And the second question, like three golden rules for effective more than seven hours sleep. <laughs> So uh, how I was defining resilience today was our ability to face challenge. Um, not necessarily be better than the challenge always, but our ability to face challenge, so less of a decrement, and then recover more efficiently from that challenge. Um, so that's how I was defining resilience, resiliency here in terms of its relation to performance. Now it's interesting when, when we think of us trying to get the, the seven or more hours of sleep, again, sometimes it's just how we perceive it. Um, a lot of times in our culture, we have this kind of catch 22. If you sleep a lot, you're viewed as being lazy. If you sleep a short amount, then it turns into a weird badge of honor of, of not performing well or, or jokes. And so it, that combination makes it hard to encourage someone to get more sleep. And so I know one of the things that we tend to say is more sleep is better. Um, if you can just get, get an, an extra 15 minutes, then try, try to do that. If you can try and get a nap, try to do that. One of the things that we find to be most effective in helping people um, get, get in, into a good rhythm of sleep is creating a rhythm your habits are very important. So getting a schedule. So getting up at, at the same time and going to bed at the same time. Um, if you notice my, my dev device that I showed you, there's a night shift mode on almost everyone's phone. I'm happy to help you activate that so that the light in your face can be decreased if you, if you need to have that on so that that can be a good, a good tip to helping improve, improve your sleep. Um, and then also utilizing some of the tools that we have here. If you tend to be someone that has difficulty in initiating sleep, so trying to get into sleep, doing some of the things like Amisha is saying to say, hey, how can we start making sure that we're not ruminating? Just taking small steps like trying to breathe and be present can help you. It's also okay if you're not falling asleep to get up and try and start your routine again. Again, our bodies love habit. And if you can get yourself into good habitual practices, that will tend to help you get, get more and better sleep. Yeah. All right. 
at this time, it is currently 12.30, so we may not have time for questions, but if you have individual questions or would like to approach us, uh, we'll be here after the event, too, for your time. I can tell you from my personal experience, 20 years in the military, um, sometimes it's not as easy as just getting a little bit more sleep because some of the operations we do, um, I'm a jump master, jumped 67 times out of aircraft, and I started asking my paratroopers, how much sleep did you get the night before? And the average was about four hours. So innovations like this are critically necessary to our soldiers that are doing something inherently dangerous um, for training, let alone combat. And so collectively, all of these items, we realize are they're necessary and we must do them. And you know, in some ways, it can be a personal inflection on how do we make ourselves better, but are there other technologies? And I think we're on the forefront of that right now to hopefully help not only just soldiers, service members, but also the civilian population. Because eventually, I will retire. Eventually, I will go out in the civilian population. And I'm sure you would like me well-rested, well-attentive, focused. Or if I have a, a, a team member of mine that's undergoing an acute stress reaction, it's critical that I, I take the things that I can learn in the services or make it applicable to those that are also doing this. So with that said, that's my personal experience. Again, thank you for our panelists and our presenters. Colonel Adam, if you'd like to make a few uh, comments too, just to. Sure, no, I'll just, uh, Gene Adam from Army Futures Command, wanna thank our great panelists in this session, the prior session, and all of you for being here today and, and uh, engaging with us. So a couple of opportunities, please feel free to stay. Uh, and we've got a reception starting here momentarily out in the foyer. Uh, so please feel free to stay and engage with all of the panel members. Uh, you'll also see uh, the Army has been pleased to sponsor here with Army Futures Command uh, these sessions. And so you can see us in our innovation showcases at the Creative Industries and down at um, 800 Congress. So you'll have more times to see other speakers with similar types of topics. So thanks so much. Thank you.